He could feel his friend's warm breath against his ear, but he kept his eyes straight ahead. Who knows how Healy's mind works, he said. He's desperate. He's got to make a case of something. The thing's been going on for weeks now. So he's going to make me a suspect? Michael skipped another small rock into the pond, but it hit the water wrong and sank. He watched the ripples tear at the surface. Maybe not. It could be a bluff. Healy wants me to give him a list of everyone who was at the party. That's 40 other potential suspects to keep him busy for a while. Joe flattened the beer can against the tree with the palm of his hand. And what am I supposed to do in the meantime? Just sit back and wait for them to come arrest me? The look on his friend's face was more than Michael could bear. No, that's not going to happen. I'll tell them the truth first. Joe was chugging the last of the three beers. Either way, I get nailed, he said. I'm an accessory, remember? And don't forget, I'm the one who filed the false police report. The f- he stood up, swaying slightly, and threw the empty crushed cans into the, the backpack. Man, life really sucks, doesn't it? Michael pulled himself up and put his hand on his friend's shoulder. Joe, what can I say, man? I never meant for any of this to happen. I don't know how everything got so screwed up. At first, Joe nodded as if he understood, but Michael could see the twitching tightness in his jaw. It made him think of a a wild animal about to bear its fangs. Then he said, yeah, well, screwing things up seems to be what you do best these days. Michael could only stare back at him. What's that supposed to mean? Look at you, man. You had it all. Big jock at school, colleges practically knocking down your door. His eyes narrowed. And a babe like Darcy Kelly? Michael waited. He had no idea where this was going. But Joe only let out a disgusted snort, then turned and began to walk back toward the car. Michael could think of nothing but to do but follow. It was a long walk back to his house, and besides, Joe had no air condition Joe was in no condition to drive. When they reached the car, Michael asked for the keys. Surprisingly, Joe didn't argue. He merely handed them over without comment. A minute, The minute Michael put his hands on the steering wheel, they began to sweat. This was where it had all begun. Less than two months ago, he had sat behind the same wheel, Joe by his side, on his way to take the driver's test. Nothing stood in the way of his future. Nothing until a stranger's voice, floating over the airwaves from 50 miles away, had told him that he had killed a man. Joe was slumped down in, in the seat, His head bounced loosely against the headrest. Michael wondered if Joe had fallen asleep, but decided he was only pretending so they wouldn't have to talk. Michael was haunted by the knowledge that if he had gone to the police the morning he first heard about Charlie Ward's death, Joe would not be in this mess. He wouldn't even be an accessory. Joe had done what he had had because he believed he was protecting Michael, and Michael had never once tried to stop him. It was already past six. Michael knew better than to take Joe home when he'd been drinking. Instead, he headed toward the highway, planning to find something somewhere, someplace to eat. If he had been paying attention as he came up the entrance ramp, Michael might have noticed that the white Toyota Tercel that had stopped in front of him at the yield sign. But his mind was on Joe. So when the Tercel began to move forward as if to merge, Michael cruising up the ramp, barely hit the brake pedal and looked at in his side-view mirror for oncoming traffic. He did not see the Tercel, and he did not see the ter- that the Tercel had suddenly and unexpectedly stopped again. When he did notice, it was too late. He slammed on the brakes as hard as he could, but slid into the Tercel's rear bumper anyway. A screech of brakes screamed through the hot summer air. Joel bolted upright. What the? She was merging, then just stopped. Michael said, scarcely getting the words out without a stutter. It's okay. I don't think there's any damage. I hardly hit it. The person at her cell had not moved, probably startled by the impact and the sound of the Mustang's brakes. Michael backed up, pulled over to the edge of the ramp, and put on the four-way, f- four-way flashers. He wanted to see if the driver was okay. He was certain he hadn't hit the car hard. Still, he needed to make sure. But before he could open the door, Joe sprang from his side of the car with an enormous purposeful strides headed toward the Tercel. Michael looked on as as Joe peered in the window of the driver's side, then jerked backward as if someone had suddenly pulled a gun on him. 
Before Michael realized what, had ha- what was happening, Joe jumped onto the hood of the Tercel and began to stomp on the windshield, alternating his feet, sometimes crashing down with both at once. He screamed at the girl in the car, calling her crazy, calling her a crazy, stupid bitch, shouting until he was hoarse that she had almost wrecked his Mustang. Michael looked on in horror as fine web-like cracks spread through the, gr- through the glass. Frantic, he ran toward the other car. What the hell are you doing? he shouted, but Joe did not seem to hear him. Again and again, he brought his foot down on the windshield until it began to cave in. Too terrified to think, Michael instinctively yanked open the car door to get the driver out before the glass caved in completely. And when he opened the door, he thought his heart might stop altogether. There, with her hands over her ears, eyes squeezed shut, screaming as loudly as she could, was Amy Ruggiero. With one final blow, the glass shattered around her, spraying tiny crystal shards that sh- shimmered like sleet across, caught in her dark hair. Michael caught... Michael put his hand around her arm and tried to pull her out, but she would not budge. She would not stop screaming. Maybe it was better if she didn't move, he decided. Glass was everywhere, in her lap, on her shoulders, on her thighs. It covered the dashboards, the dashboard, the seats, the floor. It lay like chipped ice on, on her feet, left vulnerable by thin-soled sandals. Above him, Joe stood on the hood of the Tercel, his body slightly hunched forward, swaying in a kind of stupor. He looked lost and confused, as if he had no idea how he had come to be there. When Joe looked up, Michael saw with shock that his face was soaked with tears. By now, several cars had stopped, parking along the edge of the ramp, clicking on their hazard lights. People Michael did not know were talking Joe from the hood of the car. were carefully helping Amy from the driver's seat, gently picking glass from her hair like apes grooming one another. How could he have not recognized Amy's grandfather's car? Michael stumbled backward and sat down on the guardrail, feeling useless. He had done this, all of this. He had set it in motion. He suspected he was Joe's real target, that his friend's uncontrollable drunken rage was really meant for him. Amy had merely been in the wrong place at the wrong time, like Charlie Ward. He looked on as a woman in baggy orange shorts dusted glass from Amy's hair. Then, for a split second, Michael thought he saw Jenna Ward's face in Amy's stunned expression. Not in her features, but in her eyes. Something in Amy's eyes made him think that for the first made her think of that first made him think of that first newspaper art photograph of Jenna. Michael swallowed hard. Everything was falling apart, shattering as surely as the windshield of the Tercel, and all he could do at this moment was sit helplessly by, surveying the wreckage while strangers frantically tried to clean up the mess.